Now playing California Triathlon Soup. Welcome to another edition of California Triathlon Soup. I'm Tom Richmond, the host of California Triathlon Soup, and today I'm with Rada Owen, U.S. Olympic swimmer, swim instructor, and hater of all things triathlon. <laughs> Rada, are you there? I am here. That's not a very nice way to welcome you to California Triathlon yeah. Soup. I wouldn't say I hate it. I just don't understand it, but that's okay. That's okay. Well, we'll we'll get into that. We'll help you unpack um, all your feelings about triathlon today um, on uh, on this uh, version of the uh, uh, podcast. Um, background: uh, Your background is you are from uh, Virginia. You swam in uh, and qual- swam at the U.S. Olympics. Uh, why don't you talk a little bit about that? What is your uh, swimming specialty. Tell us a little, little bit about your path to the Olympics. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that'd be a great start. Okay. Well, I did. I grew up in Richmond, Virginia, and started swimming at the age of four, uh, not in any kind of competitive manner, just uh, swim lessons. And summer league, we had a pool in our neighborhood that was you know, within walking distance and started there. And it was, um, it was kind of one of those things where my parents we had to do something in the summertime sports wise. And I loved the water. I loved going to the pool. I could play there all day. So we would have swim practice and then I'd stay there and play all day. And then that, um, you know, 16, 12, 16 years later turned into the Olympics. (laughs) Um, We joined a club team around the age of six, Uh, Just a local club team is year-round swimming for those that don't know the difference between summer league and kind of competitive swimming. And just um, that was my thing. It was both me and my sister swam. And uh, it took me to Auburn University. I got a full scholarship. And uh, I chose Auburn. I was recruited by various schools, and I, I chose Auburn. I went there on a recruiting trip and just knew that's where I belonged. And, uh, at Auburn, they turned me into an Olympian. So that's pretty much the, uh, the short version of my path to the Olympics. Who who was, um, who was your coach at Auburn? Uh, David Marsh was my head coach. We had lots of the coaches, uh, coaches on staff, but David Marsh was our head coach and Kim Bracken, uh, was kind of more of my personal coach. I mean, David was my coach, but, um, Kim Bracken had a, a big, a big hand in my development, um, to the Olympics. So, and, and Auburn, um, especially at that time, um, was the top of top of the heap, correct? Yeah, I was, um, uh, I was kind of in the class that kind of turned the corner for Auburn. They were, I think they were 12th at NCAAs the year that, um, my senior year in, in high school, And I knew I wanted to go to a school that wasn't number one. I didn't want to be a a small fish in a big pond. Um, So Auburn was perfect for me because my class was kind of the turning point. And that my freshman year, we went from 12th to 7th. So my freshman year, we were 7th. And then my fifth year was the year that they won for the first time. So it was kind of like I would, we, my, my class never won a title, but we kept going up and up and up. And then we recruited, you know, we were able to kind of set the tone and recruit the better kids so that my fifth year there, they won for the first time. The, the women did, the men had already won at this point, but um, the women's team won. So I feel like I kind of had a hand in developing that team and um, kind of turning, turning it around. For- so at, is, um, is the, I'm, I'm familiar, um, with division three swimming a little bit. Um, some friends who do division three swimming, um, a coach coach, they place on a men's and women's team. I think they place 18 can be, can compete in a, in a tournament. Is that, tell me how uh, division one swimming works. Yes. That's the same as division one. Um, you can send, you have to qualify for NCAAs 
and they're not um, they're not slow times. It's it's uh, pretty fast to to get the A cut for NCAA's, and there's very few teams that actually field 18 full swimmers. Most teams take a diver as well. A diver counts as a half of a, a half of a person. I know that sounds terrible, but that's just because there's less events in diving. That's kind of how it works. So some teams will have, um, you know, 17 swimmers and then two divers. I'm, I'm pretty sure it's still the same. I Things change, but I'm pretty sure that's still still the case. So some teams, you know, can only qualify 10 people because the times are just really fast to make. Uh, but yeah, that's it's still you can take 18. When I was swimming, the men's team, they had to actually leave people at home. People legit qualified for NCAAs, but they had to decide who they were going to bring, who was going to score the most points, who was the most valuable. So they actually, I think one year, actually had to leave one or two people at home, which is not, it's not usual. It's very rare that happens, I think, but unfortunately it did happen. Well, you just have so many fast people. <laughs> so a coach, a coach might say, hey, I need somebody who can impact my relays more or I need a breaststroker in this distance and that person is more valuable to the total number of points versus some other discipline. Yeah, it's a lot of a strategy, you know, trying to put somebody on your team that will score every time they swim. Um, and, and sometimes you don't have that problem because you only had 10 swimmers that qualified anyways. Um, so you may have a breaststroker that, can swim the 100, 200 breast, and then they have to figure out an event to swim on the third day. Um, whereas I like, I did various events. So one year I did the 200 back, one year I did the 100 free. And I mean, I, I had my two normal events, like 500, 200 free. And then my third event kind of went wherever they needed me. I was a very versatile swimmer. So it, 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 it's, it's good to be versatile because that means you probably get more of an opportunity. So when you're when you're swimming, say a hundred free, or when you were when you were swimming at your peak, a hundred free or two hundred or five hundred, what what was the time? What was what, what were those times like? Um, I my hundred free, I was probably like forty nine low, forty eight high, which seems slow nowadays. But now everybody remember this was like ninety six to two thousand. Um, I wasn't a great hundred freestyler. That was kind of a full sprint for me. I was more of a mid distance, long distance. Um, my 200 free was like 144, 145 range. Um, this is yards, by the way, if anybody out there listening um, is thinking I could go that meters, that's, that would be fantastic. Uh, <laughs> and my 500 free, God, I don't even remember, um, like 444-ish, 445, I think. We just, um, tri- triathletes are, uh, we, we're just envious. We're just haters. <laughs> Don't be haters because all I can do is swim. I don't do anything else well, which is why I don't understand triathlons. <laughs> there was a um, there was a boy I saw an article recently, a ten year old boy. Um, I don't know if you saw the story, but it got it got pretty, yeah. pretty wide coverage. Uh, his name's Clark Kent, and he had beaten some sort of Michael Phelps record. I think it was hundred uh, mm-hmm. fly when he at the same age. Um, I thought that was a pretty cute story for sure. Yeah, I actually ended up seeing the video. It was, um, I believe it was the age group, the meat record for that pr- particular meat um, had not been broken since Michael Phelps was that age. So that's anytime you break a Phelps record, it's even if it's a meat record or an actual like national age group record, you know, that's something that he'll take with him for the rest of his life. That's pretty cool. Yeah, Yeah, I'm sure he was pretty happy about that. Yeah, even even if it wasn't Michael Phelps, it, having a record be that old is is pretty cool. Um, so good for him. So, and his name is Clark Kent. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the Superman. It was so funny. Like that's that's that's, that's just such a great story. Mm-hmm. Um. So so you went from Richmond, Virginia, um, to to Auburn. What were um just in this world? Because trust me, I don't think most of our uh you know, I, I've never, I was never recruited for certainly swimming. Um, um, so we don't know that world necessarily. Tell us some of the schools that recruited you. What, who, who are those, uh, colleges that recruited you, uh, that didn't, didn't get your services? Um, Arizona, Texas. Um, what, what's interesting is when, when you're, I mean, I was not the best in the country by any means when I was in high school, 
I was, um, I was up there, but I think coaches could look at me and see I had a lot of potential. And that's what Marsh was really good at was noticing who could get better. Cause you don't necessarily always want to recruit the best swimmers because it can kind of go either way. Um, so anyways, uh, so it was Arizona, Texas, but I, I kind of narrowed them down. I got a lot of letters and phone calls from schools that I wasn't interested in. And I like to brag that I was, uh, recruited by all the Ivy league schools <laughs> because they, you know, they want to just throw it out there, but I wanted a scholarship. I wanted to be able to actually have my swimming pay for my school. Um, it, you know, I, I think not that I could have gotten into Harvard or Yale, but it was kind of cool that they, um, they recruited me. Um, so I narrowed it down to Arizona, Texas, uh, UCLA. I was like hell bent on going to Los Angeles. At first it was USC. I really wanted to go to USC. And then I was out here, um, in high school for a meet and I went to the USC campus and no offense to Trojans out there, but I just was like, Oh, I don't, I mean, I was coming from Richmond, Virginia, where there's trees everywhere. You know, I was, I grew up in the suburbs and I'm out driving around with my coach on the outskirts of USC. And I'm just thinking, oh, I don't think I want to go to school here. <laughs> it's not very pretty outside of USC. Um, more, more like, more like you should have been over at Pepperdine, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I just, I kind of had this idea of what Los Angeles looked like before I ever went. And then when I got to USC, it was like, oh, this is like a city. I mean, it is like dirty. It's a city. I mean, the campus itself is nice, but when you get on the outskirts, it's a, it is city. So, um, for all, so then for you all the, um, for all the USC alums, we'll be posting her, uh, home email address. Uh, feel free to send that to <laughs> Rada Owen. <laughs> That's right. Give me the hate. Hey, I said, I like the campus. The campus is nice. So then UCLA started recruiting me and, um, and uh, I took a trip out here to UCLA. It was my first recruiting trip, and I was set. I was a little bummed that they didn't have a men's team because, as a female athlete, you ha you have to have men to train with. Um, it just it's a different outlet. It's a different vibe to have you know guys to kind of bounce your skills off of. Um, and I was I had the best time. They they gave me the whole you know kind of Hollywood. Cause I was super into, you know, actors and stuff. And they took me to all the fancy places. They took me to OJ's house. Now keep in mind, this was 1996. <laughs> so OJ's house was still there. Um, and then, uh, and then I took my recruiting trip to Auburn and I, that was it. I knew where I belonged. Um, but at, I had narrowed it down to those those very few schools to actually take recruiting trips to. Now, when you obviously um, that you know, Auburn and Alabama and Georgia, they're in the Florida, they're in the SEC. And you know, when you think of the SEC, you, you think of swimming. That's the that's the top sport in the SEC, right? <laughs> Wait, do I think of swimming, or does the general well, public? Because the, the general are you being the general public, right? I mean, that's the that's what you think of. Oh, yeah, yeah. There's no other sport that anybody. Um, yeah, swimming's definitely the biggest money maker. <laughs> We're being sarcastic for those out there listening. So you're 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 at you're at Auburn. You're on track to become an Olympian. Um, uh, and I, I can't imagine being on a campus where, uh, you know, the football players, the third string, whatever. Is has probably have more name recognition than you know an awesome Olympic swimmer. Is that did you guys feel like you were getting equal equal play with the football team and things like that? Surprisingly, um, we didn't really notice it because this was pre social media. Um, now athletes can actually be famous because of social media. They can get their names no matter what. I mean, whether you're a football player. We knew we were the, at the time, we were the best team on campus in terms of, you know, placing and who was winning more championships. But the people in Auburn knew that. I mean, they, people knew that swimmers were good and that we had, you know, lots of Olympians come out of the program. So when you're there in it, no, you don't feel like, you know, if we would walk around wearing Auburn swimming stuff, be like, oh, you, that's cool. You're on the swim team. Like they knew that we were good athletes. 
nowadays, you know, with social media, I think it, it people now know the football players' names. Like even the guy that sits on the bench, you know, he can be famous and sign autographs. So it's it's a little different, I think. But when when we were there, it didn't it didn't feel like we definitely got the benefit of football. We get to use football's money and we get we have great facilities at Auburn. So it's a it's a it's a good relationship to have. It's great to have a, a really strong football team. And it's fun. It's I'm so I love having gone to a football school. It's fun to have um, somebody to cheer for. And you went you know? to some or all, as many games as you could? Actually, then, no. We didn't care about games. <laughs> it's so funny to think how much money and time I'll spend to fly back to, to Atlanta to go to Auburn for a football game. And – when I was there, okay, maybe we'd go for the first half. And it's like, oh, this, you know, this is boring. Let's go home. <laughs> because, you know, we had been, had a two or three hour practice that morning. And it just wasn't, it wasn't the spectacle in our minds that it kind of is now. And uh, yeah, so it's kind of funny how, how much I did not care about football when I went, when I was actually in school. So so you 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 go from Richmond. You're looking at schools. Um, thank goodness you you know you you, uh, you avoid Los Angeles. You you head to Auburn. Um, and now, if I may ask, where where do you live? I'm in Los Angeles. I'm just north of the airport in a little area called Westchester. <laughs> I know I made I made my way out here, but I made it. My way out here at the right time when I was supposed to make it out here. I, I love that. I love that. It's like, yeah, LA is not really the you know place. It's like, and and yeah, no, I'm, I'm giving you a hard time, which I hope you. Yeah, no, to give me a hard time, I love it. I'll, I'll, so I'll you take do it. Um, you do some coaching. You do uh, you coach um, you coach triathletes, and I would love to get um, some of your uh, some of your experience in, in coaching, uh, in, in coaching triathlete, triathletes are unique breed. And then as well as, um, a little later, talk about some of the, the training that you give, uh, that you give some triathletes. I'd love to know what your kind of your strategy is when you're working with us crazies. (laughs) Yeah, I, um, I don't just work with triathletes. I actually, anybody who is in the pool, I'm, I, I don't call myself a swim coach. I'm more of a stroke technician. I work with people on their stroke technique, whether that be little kids all the way up to adults, age group swimmers, competitive swimmers, novice kids, master swimmers. Um, I do coach masters. So we have, we have quite a few triathletes who swim with us and uh, most swimming is a trained skill and swimming properly is even more a trained skill. And a lot of people don't realize that people will get in the pool and swim across the pool and be completely winded. And they wonder, well, you know, I run marathons. Why am I so tired? Well, it's as if you ran 25 yards in a high knee, um, you know, with your knees really high. So it's, it's, you have to learn how to swim properly. And that's what I do to allow people to do longer triathlons because, you know, the swimming comes first. If you use all of your energy, just doing this short swim, you know, there you go. So you really have to focus on the swim portion of it, even though it's the shortest, because it is so technical and you can either conserve your energy and swim efficiently and fast, or you can just, you know, hack your way through it and be exhausted. So I'm, I do a lot of stroke work, individual stroke work, but then we, I also see a lot of triathletes lap swimming and that is the worst, that is the worst thing you can do is just lap swim. So I'm a big proponent. I try to get people to join an organized swim group, usually referred to as masters because a coach is dictating how much you're swimming, how much rest you're getting, um, how fast you should be going. And it's just a great way to train yourself properly for the race so that you're not just swimming back and forth at the same pace, looking at your watch. Um, so that's pretty much what I do all day long, seven days a week. I'm at some form. I'm, I'm at some pool, whether it's a public pool or a private pool. It's not a bad gig. No, not at all. I was, <laughs> um, I was at a, um, I, a pool a couple weeks ago and, and I'm always looking at 
um, being efficient and, you know, trying to be efficient and the number of strokes on the 25 yards. It's what's, what's your stroke count on the 25? It depends on how fast I'm going, but if I'm just swimming relaxed, I'm about 11 or 12. Right. Depending on how many kickouts I do, if I just take like two or three kickouts, it's probably and, 10 or 11. And so I witnessed a bunch of, you know, strokes and uh, there was, I think previously I had seen, you know, maybe 35, uh, an athlete did 35. Um, and then I just happened to witness. Yes. Five yard. They did 35. Ooh, and I just man. noticed last week there was an athlete in the, in the water, a gentleman. And I counted two or three times and it was 44 strokes on the 25. I don't know how that's possible. <laughs> yeah. And, <laughs> I'm not laughing at him. I just don't know. That's that's a lot of strokes to fit in a short distance. And I, I can't I can't help myself yeah. but to go over. Um, and you know, most of the time, folks are pretty open to at least you know taking a pointer or two. Um, but I, you know, you walk up to the lifeguard or whoever's there, and you say, you know, don't they swim here every day? And you, yep, they swim here every day. And say, so, well, you don't you won't say anything. It's like, well, people are you know, pretty private about their swimming, you know, or maybe they're afraid they, they, uh, you know, they, they'll just won't get the good response. But I've, I've, my experience is people are super open to, to taking a, a pointer or two because, you know, it, it can help. Yeah, it can. And I can see why a lifeguard wouldn't give pointers because, you know, if you give one thing to one person, then suddenly all these people come up and, you know, they've got a job to do. But I mean, I don't just give out pointers to people. Um, I mean, it, it depends on the situation, but, you know, because it's my job. But so, yeah, I have found that a lot of people are very protective of what they do and they don't, especially in the pool. And I actually had a master swimmer one time that was swimming. My workout was paying a monthly fee to come swim. And I just gave him a little pointer and he got very defensive, like as if I insulted him. And I thought, okay, I'm done. People can ask me for tips, but I just won't dole them out because you just never know. People just want to show up and swim. They don't care how they swim. But then there's people who are obsessed with it. Like, Rada, watch my, you know, how's my hand entry? Like every single time they're at the wall and I'm like, just swim. You can't think about it that much or you will drive yourself crazy. (laughs) So it's a, it's a balance. You people all have their quirks. Do you have uh, at least one swimmer? Do you know this person um, who, you know, you'll have a set that you say 3000 and they're at 2700 and it's time to go. And it's like, well, I have to, I have to swim 300 more because I have to do, do you know that person? (laughs) Uh, yes, I do. I know that person. And yeah, if, if he doesn't get to 3000, he will stay after. And I try to explain to him that just doing a 200 slow is not going to make you any better. It, you, you actually be better off doing 1800 of your hardest swimming than 3000 of your slowest, but it does not, it, it's just the number that he has to get to. It's an OCD thing. So I, yes, I know. I know. I'm sure there's more people like that. They're just not as open about it as this. Yeah, I think is. every and knows everybody who has a, everybody <laughs> has everybody knows somebody like that. I think, and you know, it's it's it, again interesting. Getting before we get into some of the triathlon stuff, it's it's the idiosyncrasies, and you know what I find with triathlon is in swimming the furthest you could be in a typical pool from your teammates that day, if it's a master swim program is 25 yards in a, on a track, it's 200 yards. And if you're biking, it could be miles. So swimming is really intimate and it, and there's all kinds of, uh, there's all kinds of nuances to doing master swimming, uh, i.e., you know, who's going to go first, who's going to go second, who's going to go third. This person doesn't like, you know, if you touch their toes, they're not going to be happy. Oh, yeah. There's a whole etiquette to swimming with other people. Absolutely. But it doesn't, you know, not to scare anyone away. It do, It's it's mostly common sense. But you're right. It is very – and you said you're, the farthest you can be away is 25 yards. Well, you'll, you'll pretty much never even be that far away. Most people are only about a yard away from the next person because you go five seconds apart. So you're maybe a yard to two yards away. 
So it is, it is very intimate. And I've seen, I've seen almost fist fights happen in a pool, not necessarily in our master's workouts, but it, in the, you know, the lap lanes, it can be a very tense, <laughs> people have their thing. And if you kind of come in that way, but you got to learn, you know, in the pool, you got to work together, but it is, it's, it is a very different sense in that there's very few things where you'll be that close to somebody when you're working the, out um, together. The, um, earlier this spring, I ran into a, a swimmer who, um, pretty empty pool, relatively say six lanes, 12 swimmers. And, uh, you know, I'm always super friendly, uh, to swimmers and, and the swimmer jumped in and said, um, you know, there's just two of us in a lane and it's like, can we circle swim? And I was like circle swim. Well, we can split a lane because there's two of us. It's easy, right? We're, we're just doing a lot of freestyle. We totally can. And boy, the look I got was unbelievable. I, I didn't even know there was like, if there's, <laughs> is there any etiquette on that when you're master swimming, do, do you have to circle swim or do you split a lane? If there's two people, you tell me. Um, well, in our case, you'll never split a lane because the workouts are pretty full. My workouts, I, and my long course workouts, I have four lanes and I usually average anywhere between 22 and 35 people, um, in the pool. I mean, a long course lane can handle that many and our yards workouts, most of them have at least four people in a lane. So, however, if you find yourself in a lane with just one other person, yeah, I'm I'm a big fan of splitting because I grew up um, in college. You do a lot of splitting when you know you have the whole pool and you've got your team in there. But a lot of people don't like they don't like the difference. The thought of having to go up the same or come back the same direction they went up it can freak people out. And also, a lot of people zone out when they swim, and they know this about themselves, so they don't want to accidentally circle swim when they're supposed to be splitting. Um, but yeah, I tell people if it's, if it's a random day where there's, you know, maybe my slow lane just has two people. I'm like, you guys can split if you want. And most well, of the time they don't. That's good insight. I, I hadn't thought about a couple of those things. Well, yeah. if you were going to, um, if you and I had one day to go swimming or, or anybody, any of our listeners had, had a day to go swimming morning, um, when you were, when you were putting together your favorite set and we'll actually try to put this, um, if we can get a, you know, a, something comes out of this, we'll actually try to put this on our website. Um, what would be a, what would be a good set to, um, say I'm a, yeah, uh, I've done a few triathlons. I'm not a beginner. I'm not a pro. Um, I, I, I just want to try a set. What, what do you, what would be a good set for that you would recommend? Um, like for instance, would it, would it have, I don't mean to interrupt you, but would it, do you incorporate a lot of, you know, I am work, other strokes, Yes, I am. I am a big, I am, I am a big fan of stepping out of your comfort zone. So I compare swimming to, okay, let's say you go get on a treadmill and you just either walk or jog at the same pace for an hour. Okay. You're going to get something out of it. You'll burn some calories, but you're not making yourself a better runner because you're not pushing yourself. Most people swim like that, just swimming freestyle at the same pace. And you should see me right now. I'm doing my little T-Rex freestyle arms. Um, they, they, that doesn't, it's not going to make you worse, but you won't become a faster swimmer. So the only way to swim faster is to swim fast. And I say that a lot to my lanes and they laugh at me because it sounds so ridiculous. Like, Hey, if you want to be a faster swimmer, swim faster. <laughs> That's literally what it means. However, most people, in fact, all people are not going to swim at a 90% effort for a 300. Elite swimmers can do that, but I can't even do that. If I, if, you know, like Clay, if he's like, go swim a fast 300, it's going to be more like 80% effort because I can't hold that pace for a 300. Now, if I say go do a 12 and a half full sprint, then you can give everything you have because it's just a 12 and a half. So with that being said, I design my workouts. I change them. So throughout the week, we'll have like, you know, a distance workout. We'll have an IM workout. We'll have a sprint workout. So I kind of cover all the bases. 
And it should, you should be doing a little of that either three times a week or within each workout. So I like to say it's a boring workout, but it's kind of a good place for people to start. Pick a certain number of 100s, let's say eight or 10, and try to do them, all of them on an interval that is only going to give you about five seconds rest, but that you can hold for all eight or 10. So that's a good kind of start. That's not a workout I give. Maybe we'll do that like once every six months. But it's a good starting place to kind of so you're getting a baseline. Who don't know their pacing. You're getting a baseline. Um, now that would be, you know, if you swim on a regular basis and you already know, like I'm, I've got a client right now who has no idea of his speed. So if I said go 450s on a minute, he has no idea how hard or how little he has to work to make a minute. So if you're in that place, if you're kind of just starting out, um, that's a good, a good set like little like baseline set to start with. Um, I like to finish my workouts with uh, like a sprint, some sort of either 50 fast or 50 is the longest thing I'll tell you to do sprint. I, I choose my words carefully when I coach. A lot of master's coaches will throw out sprint. You know, they'll be like, go uh, 450s on 45 long course sprint. And it's like, you can't do that because 45 doesn't give you enough rest to sprint. You'll just be making 450s on 45. So if I want my swimmers to sprint, I'll either give them a ton of rest or I'll give them rest and it'll be a really short distance. So you should always do some sort of full blast 95 to 100% effort in your workout. But keep in mind, it's going to be a short distance. You're not going to be able to do... 400s at that pace so that's that's a big thing that a lot of triathletes don't understand they just think they need to swim 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 at the same pace but to get faster in that longer pace you actually have to make yourself faster in a shorter it does uh, and, and i'm gonna i'm, I'm gonna sense? use the example of a 25 and and you can tell me if i'm i'm wrong or not so on a 25 um you know a, a good number for a sprint is say Every 30 seconds, if you're going to do eight of them every 30 seconds, because by that point in the swim, you're uh, so tired. If you said do it every 35 or 30, you know, 25 seconds, you'd be like, well, where, where are we at? Um, and, but if I really want to sprint those sometimes, I mean, full recovery, instead of 30 seconds, I'll say 45 seconds or even on the minute. Is that? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Even I, for me to do eight 25s full sprint, 30 would not be enough rest. I would be completely fatigued by number three. And this is because I know how to sprint. Sprinting, like I said earlier, swimming is a trained skill. Sprinting is a trained skill. My, uh, the swimmers in my fourth lane, which is my, I call them my least fastest lane. I don't like to call them the slow lane because they're not slow. They will swim when I watch them, if I say, okay, do a 50 easy and then a 25 sprint, I can't tell the difference with most of them, but they think that they're sprinting. It's not like they're purposely being lazy. They just don't know how to physically move their arms and legs that fast. So for a lot of swimmers like that, kind of swimmers who found swimming later in life, they 30 may be enough rest. So I always say to my swimmers, if you think you're getting too much rest, you're not going fast enough. You're not sprinting. So yeah, for me, 30 seconds, I, I would need okay. more if I'm doing full sprint. Mostly. Yeah. In fact, can I tell you this? One of the hardest master's workouts I ever did was with a guy who is very much like me. He's more, he's, he's less of a yardage person and more of a quality versus quantity. And he gave us 1625s. And at the pool we were swimming at, it was short course meters and it had blocks. They were on two minutes because we would dive in, sprint, we'd get out and we'd walk around. And then by that point, we'd have, you know, maybe 45 seconds of rest. It was the hardest master's workout I've ever done in my life. 1625s on two minutes, all out. That's all. That's all it took was 1625s versus doing... 3,400 yeah, meters in, in an your hour. Garment, you, you only get credit swimming. for like, uh, that's a half hour. What's that? 4,400, 400 yards. That's, that's nothing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's nothing. 
but you will crawl out of there if you actually if you actually sprint. Now I have a lot of swimmers who, if I gave that to them, they would be like, "Oh my god, this is a waste of time." I would. I don't give that to my swimmers just because the, the way our pools laid out, it just wouldn't even work. But, um, but yeah, it it takes a lot of trust. I tell, I'm like, trust me. You know, when I do give sprint sets, and most of my swimmers do trust me. They're like, yeah, I'll do whatever you know you give me, which is good. You know, you so, want you want to um, be like that. Relative to, um, so we'll we'll put a we'll we'll we're gonna cobble this together and put a um, her. Uh, uh, Rada's uh, favorite workout on our on our web page, and you'll see that at californiatriathlon.org. dot um, org. Yeah, I can actually give you one um, to actually put up. That was just I was just kind of speaking off the top of my head, but there's a few workouts I've given that that I really I would really want to do. That that would be, I can, that would be great. I, I definitely. Um, so I've personally stayed away from fly just because. Um, I te- you know, if you saw me fly, I do fly. I think they call that active drowning and, um, and just from the technique <laughs> and an injury point of view, but I, I will add fly. I'll put a hundred in not fly. I'll do a hundred. I am, and I'll just switch in backstroke or breast into that first one. And when you add, I am into your sets, you know, when I get done, I'm like, wow, I really felt that. And then that, you know, if it's, if it's just a hundred, I am the last 25 when I'm swimming, uh, forward crawl or freestyle is, um, I, I feel so strong on that last 25. I'm like, if I get to that 25, it just feels amazing. Um, Oh, absolutely. I am. I didn't even touch on that. That's, uh, it's, it's just for a lot of people, it's muscle confusion. So it's, it's doing something different and, you know, injuries aside, if you don't have an injury, I, I'll have swimmers that be like, well, I don't really know how to do fly, so can I do something else? And I'll just say, just try it. If as long as you're doing something, and most of the time, they can do some form of fly. And I, I keep the amount of fly that I give those, you know, those groups, you know, low. But always try it. You know, people just don't want to step out of their comfort. They're afraid to do something they're not good at. Like yesterday, I gave... Uh, at the end of our I am workout, I gave 20, 25 fly on 30 seconds. And I just said, just the goal is to make as many of them, them as you either can or want to, because it's masters. And most everybody did 20 or at least, at least like 15 of them. So that's pretty good. Well, I, well, yeah. I appreciate it. Well, one, one surprise that uh, I hope that you'll take us up on is, you know, you had talked, uh, we had talked offline about, uh, not understanding that triathlons, you know, a little bit of a cult. Um, and certainly, um, we, uh, I just said the nicest of terms, but no, that's, we'll take that. Um, that triathletes, uh, neglect the swimming portion. Now as a background, I think when they started, um, first triathlon, I, there, there was actually a gentleman, Russ Jones, who lives in Southern California and he's still doing triathlons. Speaking of Colton. So he won the first triathlon in 1974, still has the bicycle, to prove it wow. still, still racing at a high level. And, um, but when folks were looking at, you know, triathlon, especially when they were doing Ironman, um, in the late, uh, seventies, uh, the, the story was, you know, I, I'm a swimmer, you know, you have a biker and you have a runner and, and which one, you know, which is the toughest. And when you look at a race today, uh, a pro will do a swim in 50 minutes. The bike is a little, you know, four hours and, uh, at least for say a male male pro and maybe 240 uh for the run so the swim is always the shortest distance um and i think that's mainly because it's the hardest thing for triathletes to to do there's not too many complaints about having the swim the shortest distance um but- and it takes the longest you know you're not going to have a 26 mile swim. Cause it's going to take you <laughs> forever to do you it. You also so. don't do, if you've ever been on a, a, a long course, um, a race course at, you know, 11 o'clock at night, you wouldn't want to put the swim at the end when you see all the cramping <laughs> and uh, you, you wouldn't want that to happen in the water in the dark. So, no, so they, they picked the, the right order, but, um, you know, I'm the race director for uh, Trick or Try. Uh, this is the fourth year of Trick or Try, and uh, we have a 70.3 mile distance. That's October 27th of this year, and we hadn't thought about uh, we we wanted to do a Rada 
a special radar wave, <laughs> which um, changes the distances so that it's a normally um, for a 70.3 mile race, you're going to do a 1.2 mile swim. You're going to do a 56 mile bike oh, and a 13 mile run. Oh my God. 13 miles would kill me. <laughs> but what if we made a special for you 1.2 mile swim? So you got all the swim, only eight miles on the, uh, on the bike and a 5k. Honestly, I don't even think I could run 5k. Okay. Well we have, here's why. Um, I can do the bike like I, you know, eight miles. That's not that I bike from, you know, Westchester down to Redondo. That's longer than eight miles. I am, I am physically a swimming specimen. I have bad hips, bad knees, small feet. I'm six feet tall. I have a size eight and a half foot. It physically hurts me to run. I mean, I, I probably could do it if somebody's chasing me, you know, I could run three miles, but I think a mile might be my limit this day, this day. We're going to, we have 90 days. Um, and, uh, we, we will work with you. Uh, we're, we're going to, we're going to figure that out. I'm going to try to convince you to do it, but, um, but we'll, uh, we'll, we'll can I walk some of the five? Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Then maybe, maybe was, we may even have to uh, help you with your hydration, uh, along the way, uh, for that walk around that lake. No problem. <laughs> But I just wanted to say, first and foremost, um, you know, I wanted to, to thank you for spending some time. You have a, a very nice approach. I mean, I, th I think the phrase that, that came out, one of the phrases was least fastest. <laughs> and I push, I push people to, uh, and I love that line because I push people to go join masters um, as a, an incredibly effective way of, first of all, having somebody there that they're accountable to. A lot of times it's in the, the morning or after work. Um, so if you can get it done in the morning, you know, you prioritize it and just the social show social aspect. And I think from a triathlete point of view, every runner that I see, most every runner I see, I say, you're going to be a future biker or you're going to be a future swimmer. Um, so because just the way the body works and, and the lifelong advantages of swimming, um, with that stated, and I have to ask this question, I know a bunch of swim coaches all across the country, a great majority of those swim coaches. And I've asked this question to every one of them. I don't see them swim and I've never seen them swim. Is that because, um, when you talked about doing a hundred free at a 49 low or, a, uh, or a 48 high, is that because you guys are looking back when you do your hundred and say, oh yeah, I'm never going to get back there. Or is it, I just stared too much at that line and I can't do it anymore. Why, why do you think most, most swim coaches don't stick with swimming? That is, that is a really good question. In fact, out of kind of my circle of swim family, I'm the only one that swims. And I mean, I don't swim that much mainly because I, I, I'm on deck more than I, I can swim. I think it's more of a... I don't think it comes from a place of ego, like, oh, I'll never be as fast as I was. It's just that swimming is really hard. <laughs> and, you know, when you swim at that level, especially kind of back, we like to say back in the day when swimming was a little different and it was more about whoever swam the most was the fastest. It's kind of like post-traumatic stress. And I, I don't mean to joke and, you know, make fun of people who actually have PTSD, but it's, it's, um, it's just people have done it for so long. And I, I even get a sense of that. If I get into a workout with a coach, I know it's just going to give us long, boring distance. It's mentally tough for me to actually do it in terms of like, okay, I'm here for the hour. This is so boring. I have to get, you know, get through it. I don't want to do it. So it's, it's more about that. It was just really hard and, people don't want to do it. I mean, I love swimming. I will always swim. I kind of have a love hate relationship with it, but I always want to swim. And you asked me earlier what my, if I could only do like one workout, it would, I mean, not to be cliche, but if, if I couldn't swim for the rest of my life, I think I would be depressed. I really want to be in the water. Um, so I think it's just more of, it's just a little bit traumatic for former elite or former, you know, competitive swimmers to go through that grind again. And it's, it's hard to find a coach that 
you really like their workouts. And that's why I try to personally give enjoyable, creative workouts that will keep you focused and you won't zone out. Cause I don't, I don't want to just swim back and forth, you know, and just do 200s and 300s and 400s. That's boring to me. So yeah, and to answer your question, I don't think it's an ego thing. I think it's just, uh, I've been there, done that. Don't really want to get wet anymore, but it's kind of sad. It makes me a little sad. Well, I just wanted to say uh, uh, thank you so much uh, for for being with uh, California Triathlon Soup. And as a um, as a guest, we'll be sending you. We'll get your um, you know, we'll get your uh, address, and we're going to send you the twenty the cherished twenty three ounce California Triathlon Soup uh, mug, um, so that you, you can have that on deck. Um, twenty three ounces of goodness is what we we call it. So. Um, we'll send one of those out to you, uh, this week and hopefully, um, hopefully you can enjoy that with your, you know, cup of coffee or cup of soup or whatever you put into a 23 ounce mug. It would be coffee. And can I just say something real quick? Cause we never really touched on it. Sure. The reason I don't understand triathlons is because I'm kind of lazy and I think running is evil and it's the worst thing on the planet because it hurts me physically. So the, I, I'm actually more impressed by triathletes, the fact that people give up their weekends almost every weekend to go run and swim and bike. So that's why I don't understand it. But I'm, I'm actually kind of impressed by people who do it. My coach did an Ironman, and I actually watched her do an Ironman. We went to cheer her on. And while she was on the bike, we had lunch. We took a nap. We went to a museum, all while she was biking. And that's pretty impressive. <laughs> <laughs> to be physically active for those that many hours. Yeah, I don't understand why people want to do it, but hey, go for it, guys. Keep trucking. <laughs> well, Rada, we appreciate you. And if you're in uh, the next time I'm in the Los Angeles area, I will make sure to uh, to, to connect. Thank you again so much uh, for being a guest on California Triathlon Soup. Yeah, thank you. And enjoy Virginia. Wow.